Uh, let's let's introduce and welcome uh, Professor Daniel Gömer, who is a, a good friend of mine from Honduras. All right, and yeah, so uh, welcome, welcome Daniel, and you can you can feel free to unmute and introduce yourself, and you should be able to share your screen, and we can get this show on the road. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? I'm so happy to be here finally after maybe mm, two and a half, three months since since this was set up. And I'm, I'm well, hmm. Zoom always does this to me. I always get lost on Zoom. Okay. Okay, you. Can everybody hear me and see me? Just things can kind of make me nervous. Yeah, I'm hearing and seeing fine, and I think everyone should be as well. If okay. anyone's not hearing, just let us know in the chat, please. Okay. Okay, so yeah, happy to be here. Um, today, we're going to go on a bird trip. We're going to go bird watching in Honduras. And my name is Daniel. I'm Daniel Germer. Uh, um, I was born in Honduras about 40 years ago, um, picked up uh, an interest in birds about 15 years ago at my senior year of college and been working with birds in many different areas of expertise through the years. Now I'm in, I'm in a teaching phase um, and this is where the... Um, the presentation comes from today. It comes from my master's thesis that goes by the name Forging Environmental Consciousness. But in the original document, it's uh, bird watching in Honduras, not, not the culture. This is an idea I've been expanding on since. So today is also a happy occasion for me because this is the first time uh, I've gotten to do something on the other side of the world and, and, and starting in Africa, I think it's especially, especially cool for me. So, okay, let's get this show on the road. Okay, so where we are, who are we? We are the Republic of Honduras. We are located uh, in Central America, yes, obviously, but kind of like in the middle of the entire continent. And there's the kind of a road map. There's a lot of roads, but if you see around here-ish, kind of no roads, this is the only part of the country where you have to access by boat or by air to get there. The other, the rest of the country, you can get from point A to point B, from, from ocean to ocean in about a day. Yeah, so. We have lots of things for starters. We are, we, we're not such, such a big country or maybe we are a big country depending on your standards, but that's what we have. And we are losing about three, minus 3% three of forest coverage every year due to a myriad of reasons from extensive agriculture, agriculture uh, cattle ranching, forest fires, whatever. We are about 10 million people. Uh, yeah, about-ish, like nine or 10. And we have registered on eBird 770 birds with around 230 so of them being migrants, neotropical migrants or South American migrants. and. We have a culture of about 100 bird watchers, at least 100 that engage in the activity at least once a month. But with eBird and what I'm going to tell you, it has grown exponentially in the last 15 years, at least from my perspective in the last 15 years bird watching. Uh, we have one endemic species, the Honduran Emerald Hummingbird, uh, it lives on the dry forests, and uh, dry forest is like if you take coral reefs 
as a very endangered ecosystem, dry forests are the are for, are for at least for me the equivalent of 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 most endangered site, most endangered ecosystem, dry forest. And we have many, 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 many prized species for uh, not only the local bird watcher for, but for bird watching tourism, uh, especially from the U.S. and and England. And we have a national bird. Yeah, the scarlet macaw. It's a. We have two of those. One that's green, and the other one that's red. So yeah, very basic approximation. And those are kind of insights on the country, but now we're going to the very, very specifics. So we have about 100 people bird watching. Yeah. And to really understand bird watching in Honduras, you have to go back to 1967, to the 60s, when the School of Biology was, uh, was founded in our national university. The teacher we had, because she was my teacher also, uh, taught ornithology perform from 67 to 2003. So our culture spins around the original ideas she, 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 she set on stone for us. And that's, that's Sherry Thorne, our teacher. But for many years, uh, bird watching and ornithology had been almost restricted to people related to biology or, or, or uh, environmental engineering sort of uh, aspects, forestry and agronomics. Birding and bird watching was not a thing for the common people yet. And that started changing in the early 90s. Yeah. When uh, Christmas bird counts started happening. So you see, it's, 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 it's something that didn't happen immediately. So there's, there's, there's this ground we've been working on. So what makes, uh, what makes people tick here for birds? What, what makes us become bird watchers? And we have what I call the primordial stimuli. When we are kids, when we are children, and, and what I'm going to tell you comes out based on a grounded theory study that, that was my thesis work. And this is how we construct birds because I asked a bunch of bird watchers here on what makes us tick and, and other kinds of questions. So when we are small, when we're kids, we see birds everywhere. And sometimes we like airplanes and sometimes we wanted to be pilots and we have a rich uh, Mesoamerican culture. So birds here are always related to the Maya people and, and to local traditions. What makes us go into birds? Sadly, shooting them slingshots because we wanted to see them closer. And I admit I am guilty of that. I had a pellet gun and the first birds I saw were actually that way. Yeah, I noticed that birds were different from each other because I used to shoot them. But yeah, here we are. <laughs> so birds, Maya culture, colors, and all the interrelated things that birds kind of do because the mind of a child is easily impressed. And we grew up with those sounds. We grew up with those colors. I remember when I was a little kid, the Rufus Snape Wren, I used to associate Rufus Snape Wren with dinosaurs. And bird watchers here also comment that, that when they were children, they had this very deep sense of liking for dinosaurs and Jurassic Park movies. So the next best thing that they stumbled upon was birds. And check that out. People also have a, they wanted to be pilots. They like aviation in general and, and, and uh, building hobby kits of, of, of airplanes. So that kind of, of brings them close to birds as well. The obvious reason wanting to fly 
is also a big consideration of why people resort to birds. Um, you get a lot of opportunities here, for example, to see hawks soaring or uh, birds, birds, you know, doing their thing, hunting. For example, um, a bird chasing, say, a, a butterfly or a lizard or whatever. People get drawn into that because they construct in their minds something that all bird watchers get amazed with. And is that if you like dinosaurs when you were a kid, yes, birds really are the next best thing because they're the closest we have to dinosaurs and they are actually dinosaurs. So with children, for example, a good way to resort for the kids to go out bird watching is through dinosaurs. Yeah. Maybe not give them the example of, of, of the chicken evolving to a dinosaur because that's that's not how it works, but children like dinosaurs and bird watching is closely related to being closer to your inner child, to being closer to those things that you go back to when you are happy. Those things, those things that make you ponder about reality and make you wonder where we've come from and where we're going. And bird watching is always done with people around. There are some folk that enjoy bird watching alone and some people just don't get bird watching if if you're not in company, if you're not engaging in group activities or engaging at least in chit-chatting and having fun and, and, and making jokes. So to each his own. And eBird, eBird, the establishment of eBird started creating a rift from that original culture that started in the 60s and became the what I like to call the quanti the quantitative era. Regardless that Ebert is a citizen science uh, project, and it is in Honduras, Ebert is more like our FIFA rank, yeah, but on a very personal level. Uh, people want to have the highest life birds. Uh, per country, the highest lists, uh, no, the, the, yeah, the highest list a year and all those that you can imagine. So that's what I mean when I say that some people do birding and some people do bird watching. And I'm sure that in wherever place you are in the world right now, somebody has told you there is a difference. Birding is more quantitative. It's more fast. It's more uh, regarding numbers and heights and who is better, who has more proficiency. Bird watching, on the other hand, no, you can use eBird, but in a very leisurely way. You can use eBird and whoops, I shouldn't be touching this. There we go. But in a more leisurely, leisurely way, leisurely. That's a hard word, eh? So, that created a rift and that's where birding culture begins around eBird about the around the top 100 eBird in the year but that's good i tend to criticize it but it was good because back in the day the only way you could be really in touch with the go comings and goings of, of, of bird watching as, as something more rigorous was through books. And back in the day, 15 years ago, you needed about four different books to bird in Honduras. So we have two books specific for Honduras now, one by uh, Jesse Fagan and Dr. Oliver Komar and the other by 
uh, Robert Gallardo, an American naturalist that's been living here uh, since the 90s, I think. Yeah, yeah, 40 years. Wow, long time. So it's easier now. And Ebert made it even easier. So everybody knows how Ebert works. Yeah, you can find a lot of your targets, for your target birds there. But it's also becoming kind of toxic. And it's creating the wrong sense of, of sharing, but not necessarily environmental consciousness. You see, birding makes you more constant. Birding makes you more organized. Birding makes you more disciplined. Yeah. People have changed their sleeping habits in Honduras in order to wake up at four in the morning and be ready by 530 for a morning of bird watching on a Sunday after a couple of drinks with friends. Yeah. There's this interesting site in Honduras that's called El Pino. That's where this kid is from. And they developed their culture, but theirs is not so based in birding. Theirs is more related to bird watching. Yeah. They use eBird, but they don't go crazy about it. And they have environmental consciousness, just like the guys that use eBird in a very uh, persistent way. We call that rigio in Honduras, like, like, like overexcitement. Yeah? We call it rigio. These guys, on the other hand, focused their culture more on enjoying more on being there, more on, on we're going to the mountain tomorrow morning. And after bird watching, we're going to swim in, in one of the pools that has a waterfall next to it or whatever, you know, like par paradise, paradise kind of thing. Why did they do it this way? Why did the others do it in their own way? But that's, that's just the way it goes. That's just the way it is. The thing is, they both created environmental conscience. Ebert plays a part, but our own upbringing, upbringing brings a part too. Because we were initially exposed to birds when we were kids. You know what we were talking a few minutes back. So originally exposed to birds and going out once on a bird watching trip, that's the way it happened to me. You know, I'm, 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 I'm a botanist, by the way. In the strict sense of the word, I'm a botanist. But here I am talking about birds. You see, that's how birds... That's how birds work on us here in Honduras. They, they, they take you over. So that's where the concept of the three R's comes in. Yeah. And how we built our environmental consciousness culture around these three. Gonna do this for a little while more till you all get dizzy. Okay. <laughs> so reward. What's our reward? What do we look for in birds? the reward of the life bird. So you can put it up on eBird and be the, the mightiest for a year, for a month, for a day. We do it for the recollection of memories. The times when, when you are remembering when you saw a life bird or remembering how you laughed with a friend or remembering when, I don't know, you stepped on dog poo. And, and you remember those things and you recollect on them. And in the recollection, and in that recollection of ideas, in that uh, remembering on how it was, you reflect. You reflect on the birds, you reflect on your life. And that makes the reward 
even higher. Mm. That's how birds work upon Honduras to create its environmental consciousness. It's, a, it's cyclic. Yeah. And people tell me I got into birds because I like birds, but after six months or so, I started liking more the idea of eBird more than the birds or, or the idea of, of being on top. And the only way to be on top is to go out birding and to study your books and to check out photos. And that's where being the best also becomes a reward. That's when taking a good photo also becomes a reward. That's when getting lists from weird and out about places is a reward. And that's why also for birders or bird watchers or once birders and now bird watchers, because you can shift, a reward is teaching because they enjoy uh, showing people new life birds or they enjoy sharing on their knowledge. That usually happens here with, with, with bird watchers that have gone over and, and, and gotten past either that gotten past the idea of of Ebert as a reward, of, as, as of being the best. So it changes. And through time, bird watchers So I'm right now, the morning we get this one, ooh. Recollection, ooh, man, I remember that time I went to that place and was looking for this bird, ooh, I remember when I saw it. And the reflection, man, birds have really given me happiness, good times, good friends. I sometimes wonder what's going to happen with the world in, say, 100 years. And there's something interesting happening in reflection and is what I call environmental apathy. You get to a point where you have so much consciousness, so much environmental consciousness, that you don't know what to do because you get frustrated because the environment is even degrading, even still. So. That's what I call environmental apathy. You grow conscious, but you go like, like the guy in the meme. What am I going to do? Like, so that happens too. And the only way to really overcome it is really to just keep bird watching and see what you can do. And not and not in a in a in a pessimistic way. No, do it in the way you want to do it because that's how you're going to find what's next. So you see a lot of of, of, of bird watchers here reinventing themselves every now and so because it kind of gets dull. So you have to spice it up for you and for the people that are starting. Yeah. So oh. Harpy Eagle, yeah. If there is a prize bird hidden in Honduras, that's the one. So what are the attitudes? What are the attitudes? Our attitudes towards the environment change. Oh, how they change. It's interesting that there's a lot of bird watchers here. Some might not admit it, but much of us got into the hobby because we use slingshots as kids. And it's something very interesting. It's an attitude male bird watchers develop here and is that you go like, <laughs> yeah. 
I'm, 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 I'm a regular guy. And then you see like, ooh, you see this is lady tail trogonal. Ooh, man, look at that bird, it's so cute. Man, so beautiful. And it's totally okay. And men don't do that in other circumstances, but they accept and embrace the beauty of that specific bird. And that's something very interesting I've seen in bird watchers here. Uh, sadly, I haven't had the chance of birding with many people from other countries. Some people from Latin America and some other people from the US and Canada. But in all, in all their styles, there's something different. Our bird watching culture is heavily influenced by the American Birding Association and the entire the entire scheme yeah of well not a scheme in the bad way but scheme the whole the whole arrangement of bird watching in north america in fact the professor that started all this sherry thorne is actually an american so so yeah what proficiencies do we develop oh boy trust me we become really proficient and because we are birding in very specific areas, for example, we're not traveling always all the time around the country, we tend to have our very specific spots where we go with a certain regularity. And trust me, we know our local backyard birds very well. That's proficiency. And how we got this proficiency? Again, recollection, reward, and reflection. Recollection, reward, and reflection and because our rewards tend to change our proficiencies tend to change when we are working ebird like we're working on quantitative proficiencies and attitudes and we are when we are enjoying birds more than anything we are developing qualitative uh, attitudes and proficiencies yeah we learn to identify them but we learn to enjoy them and you can be at the same time, not with everybody, of course, but you can be at the same time at the same bird watch with people that are bird watching and with people that are birding. Yeah. Bird watchers tend to, to stray away a bit at the back. Birders tend to go front, but we enjoy it. And in this weird world, we have to learn to enjoy it because Everybody has differences, but we all have things in common. So, I don't know, maybe kind of a stoic thought right there, but it is what it is. And birds are there. We got to enjoy them. Because why not? What's wrong on waking up very early, early on a Sunday? What's wrong with packing up your bags and leaving off on a run to find some rare bird in your area? What's wrong with trying to be the best? There's nothing wrong with it. As long as you're having fun and you're doing the right thing. Many bird watchers and birders in Honduras think that way. That bird right there, the great tail grackle, is probably our most abundant bird. Yeah, it's everywhere, everywhere where there's people at least. And I wanted to make this presentation uh, with flashy birds and with dull birds as well because because why not? We, got, we get to enjoy them all. And that way you don't get the idea that we only have flashy birds because we don't only have flashy birds. We have semi-flashy and non-flashy. But the gray tail grackle, for example, is totally black. The female is kind of brownish, but they're very cool when, when, when in their mating seasons. It's very cool. Thank you. 
Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for giving Honduras the opportunity to knock on your door and, and talk bird for a while. Uh, thank you for bird watching wherever you are. Bird watchers change the world every day. Thank you for creating your own cultures as trust me, we enjoy ours. If you ever want to come to a nice place and bird watch or bird, do plan a trip to Honduras. We have many an experienced guide that'll give you the triple of, 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 of blah, that'll give you the trip of your lifetime here in the Neo Tropics. So thank you. That's all for me. And I'm gonna stop sharing, or I don't know what do I have to do. So gonna stop sharing. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Daniel, uh, for this wonderful presentation and uh, I must say that before I start to talk about anything else that you and I have a lot in common, and especially in how we view um, observing birds and enjoying birds. So one of the things that I noticed in the chat is that there was there was a little black box on your screen that was obscuring some of yes. the information. Not sure what was causing that, but Elizabeth is wondering what was the name of the shorebird Ooh. that you had there. Okay, let me see the shorebird. It was just on one of the, the second to last slides or maybe third oh, okay. to last or something. Yeah. That's the least sandpiper. That's a species that's very common in wetlands here during migration. And they breed really, 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 really up north in Alaska. So that's a very cool bird once you get their, to know their life stories. Because otherwise it's a kind of a dull thing when you see it here in migration yeah, I, I personally really enjoy shorebirds so let's i'm just gonna pointedly not start to talk about shorebirds <laughs> so, uh, we'll never we'll never leave here so um oh lovely elizabeth is saying that wow uh, we just had lee sandpipers i love their little yellow legs so yeah um so if there's anyone who has any questions for um, Professor Daniel, please free to put it in the chat. Yes. Um, thank you, your love of birds is very infectious. And I'm sure that your country people would also agree to that. Yeah, um, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so it appears that we don't have, you don't have any questions. No. Um, Oh, that's yeah. sad. I, I think it's I think it's a, a lot for, for people to really think about and internalize because it's it's something that it's a little bit uh, I would say greater than something that is academic or something that is um, taught in conventional schooling. Yeah, that, you know. Um, yeah. That, that. Someone is asking when is the best time to to visit. Yes. Yeah. The, October the, November. Yeah, October, November, that's because when the North American migrants are here. So it's a good, it's a good moment to see the, the, from the, well, from both sides of the, man, my English just crashed. <laughs> from, from both North sides America, of right? the, from, from the Atlantic and the Pacific. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And there's another question here. How are we engaging children? Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, our culture is, is closely tied to American Birding Association, Cornell, uh, Laboratory of Ornithology, and eBird. So there's this program, uh, bird. Oh, man, my English just crashed. Seriously. Hmm. Well, anyway, there's this, this uh, school program created by Cornell that they tend to use it a lot. That's it's this citizen science thing by Cornell that, that really works. Uh, bird watching clubs tend to uh, cater for children. During the pandemic this last, say what, 18 months, it, it has kind of stopped. We've been doing with, with children, Zooms and, and, and things like that and take them virtual bird watching or, or whatever. Uh, my best bird watching experience. Oh boy. 
Oh boy, it'd be hard. It'd be hard to to narrow to even three. But the I saw a couple of harpy eagles once, and and you know what's really really amazing about that is that that bird is so gargantuanly big that we were we were watching them maybe 80 feet we were watching the nest about 80 feet and they left that when, when they left woof, you can hear their flaps woof 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 and when they flew up above us in the forest it created a shadow on the forest that's how big they are and you could clearly see their, their silhouettes in the ground of how big they are. And and yeah, <laughs> they're that big and that's 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 cool. Uh, contact to bird, birding in Honduras. Uh, send me an email. I'll, I'm going to post it right here. Send me an email and I'm going to put you in touch with the best guy I know that is right now engaging in doing some very nice tours to wherever you want to go here he does bird watching and he does birding so he 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 digs both so yeah i would say if i if if i ever um saw a harpy eagle which is one of my target birds i would remember it for the rest of my life definitely Okay, so if and does anyone have any any further questions for us? I think I think uh, I think we I think we're good. Um, yeah, so uh, Danielle, I would like to thank you for presenting this wonderful webinar in your second language, right? <laughs> I definitely Bert Sleuth, Bert Sleuth, Bert Sleuth. That's so, so Bert sorry Sleuth. for interrupting you. Bert Sleuth. That's yeah, that's the name that's of, of the Ebert program, man. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> At least it came to you now and it didn't come to you after we, we ended this call. Yes. Um, okay, so thank you everyone. Sorry for interrupting you. No, no problem at all. <laughs> no problem at all. Thanks everyone. Um and hope to see you all again. Um, remember, tomorrow is Bird is a Word with me. Uh, I'll be speaking with Susie of uh, the Casual Bird podcast. And um, yeah, and have a good one, everyone. Have a good week and happy birding and happy bird watching, whichever is your fancy. So take care. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye bye.